Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you guys today. Um, I hope we'll have a, a little bit of fun with this. I tend to take myself not too seriously um, and uh, we'll make some jokes about security and have a little fun with my background and history here, um, but then have uh, a hopefully informative discussion on attacker history, evolution, motivations, and what I think that means for us as uh, defenders and blue teamers today. So before, if we can get our slides to cooperate here. Before we get deep into attack revolution, um, the first thing I actually would like to do is talk about uh, who I am and why you should care about anything I have to say. Um, first and foremost, I am the chief security officer at Critical Start. And because that title generally is completely ambiguous and means nothing, I'll go into a little bit more detail. At Critical Start, I currently run everything that encompasses security operations, cyber threat intelligence, detection engineering, as well as everything in customer success, support, implementations, and our entire portfolio that rolls up through managed services. So as a company, um, we are a managed service and detection and response organization and everything that goes into the operations of that uh, belongs to me within the organization. So when it comes to dealing with incidents, intrusion response, and actively detecting and stopping breaches for customers, that all falls under my responsibility. I understand that I still look like I could be attending here where I graduated high school. And if I shaved, I can pass for this guy with ease, but I have been doing this for as long as this was still a thing. For those of you who may not have been around back in those days, that goes all the way back to about here. I started my career here where I began doing this before anybody even talked about formulating these guys. Because I did cyber in the Navy, most of my friends seem to think my job should have looked something like this in places like this. In reality, it starts off looking more like this in places like this. Um, I spent time here floating off the coast of here and here, and after spending more than enough time in places like this and this, I decided to go work here so that I could hopefully spend a little bit more time here. Unfortunately, I was incorrect because after I went to work there, I immediately went back here and spent another year or so deployed. Because I worked here, now all my friends suddenly thought I must be this guy and my job looked something like this. And I would try to convince them that they were more accurate when they thought my job looked like this. And in reality, it mostly looked like this. After spending enough time doing this, I decided to go work here so I could do less of this. And I spent eight years helping to build and run Global Security Operations Center. Um, I had a tremendously good time working there. I had an amazing team, met a bunch of incredible people, and we built up a global 24 by 7 follow the sun model stock on a very large SIM deployment and learned an incredible amount of hard lessons about dealing with APT threats today. After eight years, I decided to go work here, initially where I came in as a CTO and then helped build out our SOAR platform. And now, like I said, I run the operations branch of our MDR division. On a personal level, I'm a big aficionado of this, which I spend entirely too much money on, and I'm addicted to doing this, which I spend way too much time doing. Despite those vices, me and this beautiful lady have been doing this for almost 19 years now. We have four of these, which on Instagram looks something like this, but in real life looks something like this, and most often something like this, which in the end brings me back to this. So now that we've taken a trip through my history, let's take a trip down attacker history lane. Let's go all the way back to here, ARPANET, the Army Routing Protocol Area Network. This was the internet that Bob Dole invented. Um, this is an early project in interconnected systems over modulated phone lines, right? If you guys remember the old modem days in an attempt to interchange data, on connected systems, mostly very early versions of Unix. But even all the way back then, we had our first instances of cyber attack, the Morris worm. Some of you may have heard of this. The Morris worm was a worm developed to self-propagate using a buffer overflow attack on the finger protocol, a protocol that doesn't really exist in practical applications of Linux today, thank God. 
Um, but this was the first in what should have been a little bit of an alarm for us to help us understand the potential implications of lack of security validation, authentication, or even perimeter controls around interconnected systems. Unfortunately, it wasn't. And over the following years, there was an entire underground subcommunity that was developed around building knowledge around hacking and attacks, vulnerabilities, buffer overflows. There was a tremendous amount of skill and data that was exchanged, learned, and shared. In fact, this sub-community became so popular in such an underground movement that we had movies made out of it, like these guys, which taught us all that our anthem should be something like this. But in reality, everything around hacking and research and activity in those days really came down to being worried about reputation. People were trying to gain renown and gain a name for themselves and become known as something great in the hacking community. Unfortunately, we did some really bad reinforcement learning on this and that some of the most renowned hackers of these days who performed very illegal activities were often then giving very visible jobs in high profile places because of the skill set and how rare that skill set was to try to stop other people from doing that. Well, this all began to come to a head in the late 90s when there was a very large problem with the Solaris operating system. No, not solar winds, not sunbursts, but an attack that came before that and that was called Solar Sunrise. That was a very large attack against the government systems, intelligence communities, and military systems. The investigation was primarily led by the FBI and DISA at the time. And there was all kinds of theories and speculation on the news about it being something related to our activities in this country and the first, not the second Gulf War, which I was not old enough to deploy to at the time. Um, in reality, it was actually just a bunch of kids from here. Again, this should have been like a Pearl Harbor style event for us in cybersecurity, a wake up call. We had a couple of kids with a relatively low motivation level, but a high level of curiosity and a mediocre level of skill, and they were able to break into what were supposed to be highly secured, network segmented, and sometimes air-gapped, quote-unquote, uh, systems from the government and defense and military, and it required response and operations and incident management at a very high level from, from some of the premier information warfare units in the military at the time, and it cost hundreds of thousands of dollars in response and millions of dollars in system changes, and yet we really didn't do anything to make true systemic or systematic change the way we looked at security for cyber or what we still called information security and information warfare back then. And the evidence for this can be very clearly seen in that not long after we had this, the Melissa virus and massive DDoS attacks against all kinds of different networks, followed very quickly by a whole set of worms, NIMDA and Code Red, and then a plethora of different SQL worms that mostly could have been stopped if we just changed our default passwords from SA blank and SASA to anything else. But this really brought us into an era of experimental hacking and kind of demonstrated the desire for the hacking community to express their curiosity, their desire to learn and grow with information security by actively breaking the law and breaking in the systems. It cost lots of different companies lots of money. There were companies that lost millions of dollars from DDoS attacks, from the NIMDA and the Code Red Worms, from SQL Worms. In fact, some of those very worms impacted the Defense Department just as much as they did commercial organizations at the time. Right? But what really happened is there was a change that happened when we entered what I like to call the first criminal age of cybersecurity. And that change really occurred at the first time someone had the idea to say, give me money or... I'll DDoS your network. And this was the very first concept of ransom-based cyber attacks. And these were mostly based around large e-commerce organizations, large banks. They impacted some of the largest ones that we still have today. And global banks and large, very large e-commerce organizations were actually impacted. And in fact, some of them did pay ransom to actually stop very large DDoS attacks from occurring and taking their network down. Now, 
the unfortunate thing about that was it didn't, or the fortunate thing about that was it didn't evolve and stay around for very long, but we did begin to adopt all kinds of new malware, like the Zbot or Zeus Trojan family, which was primarily focused on fraud activity, identity theft, and credential theft, and was very, very successful. At the time, very hard to detect an endpoint systems, evasive, and had multiple variants out there. It was very easy to change and adapt, that it was semi-modular as a piece of malware. Um, and for the time, well, it was way ahead of the time, frankly speaking. However, we didn't really see this proliferate in the same way that we see ransomware now or even other malware attacks now. And the question we have to ask is, if the money was there, if it was possible, why didn't we see as much activity back then as we do now for this kind of thing? And the reality of it is, is because that money was very, very hard to actually get payment for. Most of these hackers that were functioning out of parents' basements or coffee shops and small apartments did not have the resources to open offshore bank accounts with anonymous tracing or fly down to Switzerland and the Cayman Islands to open a bank account that would hold up against the litigation power of the United States if we were to try to come down to them. And so this money was not able to be received in ways that were effectively anonymous, and therefore a lot of this slowly faded away or at least stayed semi under the radar and what could be transacted on early versions of the dark web with identity theft and exchange. That all began to change right about the year 2007 where we entered into the age of cyber war. And we transitioned from information war to cyber war when we had the first open, or at least openly known, nation state attack that was conducted for political motivations by a large nation. This nation, Estonia, was what was considered to be the largest interconnected or internet savvy Eastern European bloc, former Soviet bloc country at the time. In fact, many of you may remember there was an entire wave of offshore hosting and uh, that occurred in Estonia because of high bandwidth, low cost availability, tech talent that was being raised up. And it was a very well thought out and well executed process. But during this wave of capitalism, growth and profit in this country, there also grew a very anti-Soviet sentiment. And as a result, they decided to take down some of these statues, which represented occupation times under the Soviet regime. And as a result, that seemed to tick off a lot of people. And if you watch the media at that time, especially the media in that area of the country, they would tell you that this was all done by, and by that I mean the cyber attack itself, was actually executed by pro-Russian or pro-Soviet pro uh, hackers. And the reality of it is, is that we all know it was actually this guy who was more than likely behind that, even if they never publicly disclosed it. But the resources that went into that attack and effectively DDoSing an entire nation, taking down services and causing massive amounts of outage and revenue loss as a response to the removal of those statues was not done by pro-Russian dissidents inside of Estonia. But what we have to understand as a part of this is that this is not the first time that information warfare was conducted. In fact, those very same guys, the Russians have been doing this far longer than any of us have really thought about it, and certainly longer than I've been involved in the industry or community. And we can go all the way back to this thing to take a very good look at what some of those things would look like. Some of you may know this is an IBM Selectric typewriter, called a Selectric typewriter because it gave you the opportunity to select the font that you were going to use. Well, one of the earliest versions of information or cyber attack, if you will, was actually conducted on these devices. Now, that's hard to understand how that's possible when you consider the fact that they are not networked or interconnected devices. But what happened was someone developed a mechanical keylogger that could hide inside this device and only be detected by X-ray log every keystroke that was done on this device and then transmit that outbound to a nearby listener on radio frequency or across the radio so that could be picked up and tracked by anybody nearby. Now, these were deployed at major government facilities at just about every embassy that you can think of around the world. And the people who created this keylog are also then purchased hotel rooms or office space in nearby buildings, set up listeners, and then logged keystrokes for years from incredibly sensitive locations, devices, including this keylogger being discovered in the ambassador in Russia and Moscow's office itself, 
And that begs the question of exactly how much and how long data had been stolen. And we really don't know the answer to that, but we know a considerable amount of damage was done and that this was done before anybody was thinking about information warfare. So well before anybody ever released this report, and if you don't know what this is, this is the APT1 report by Mandiant that was released in 2011. This is kind of the seminal white paper covering the very first major APT actor that we were able to give true attribution to. I highly recommend if you haven't read it, go read it. It's fascinating. The guys did a phenomenal job writing this up when they did it. Um, but and before this, before APT1 and before this report, people weren't really thinking about actors in terms of nation states or groups with combined motivations or what they might actually be doing. But after this, we began to shift our perception to understand that hey, this kind of warfare has been going on for quite some time, and it is not restricted only to the military industrial community. In fact, if we look at the target summary reports for APT1, we can see that there's quite a bit on that target summary report that has absolutely nothing to do with military industrial. In fact, there's some things that might ask you to, or cause you to, to ask questions about why they would be targeting certain things like energy, transportation, construction and manufacturing, engineering sciences, legal services. Those are all fairly high in the list of organizations that were confirmed to have been targeted by APT-1. But to understand why those organizations we've targeted by HP21, we first have to understand who they are. Well, first and foremost, they're a Chinese PLA threat actor. We know that they are part of the People's Liberation Army and that they act on behalf of the Chinese nation to execute their strategy in cyberspace, which includes the way that China asserts its influence internationally. Unlike other nations, which may do this militarily, right, China asserts its international power with economic advantage especially when it comes to cybersecurity. So very much so when we see activities related to Chinese actors in the cybersecurity world, like APT1, what we see are things being done to gain economic advantage, like intellectual property theft and the stealing and replication of that intellectual property at a lower manufacturing cost and then putting businesses out based on a competitor at a lower price point. This is a very common strategy. In fact, it's an open public strategy to conduct this kind of activity against American uh, public companies. Now, that's something we can use to understand how APT1 acts as a part of PLA. But if we were to look again at this guy and what he's trying to do, we can take a look at the target list here and we can see that it is very, very different. And in fact, it reflects the motivations that we often see that Russia likes to flex its international influence militarily. We can see that demonstrated in Ukraine and Crimea and Georgia too as well, but we can also see it reflected by AP28, APT28, who is in fact a Russian cyber actor in the targets by which they have. Governments, military, international organizations and embassies. You can notice, interestingly enough, that on that target map, we see Europe and South America, but absolutely nothing in North America, which would seem strange unless you also consider the fact that the organization who made this report also contracts for the US government in cyber defense investigations and forensics, and is probably under some kind of NDA as well as security clearance that they're not allowed to disclose information about any attacks that they may have been, may have been part of investigating for that organization. When you consider that, then it makes sense that there were zero attacks that would color in the map for North America, specifically for the United States. Now, as these attacks from organizations like APT1 and APT28 have become more advanced, become more successful, as they've learned how to bypass controls and establish persistence, as they've developed and worked with new versions of open source tools, well, these other organizations that are out there have also been paying very, very close attention. Um, I think CrowdStrike actually does a phenomenal job of classifying and tracking many of these organizations. I thought this was a great graphic. These are some of the guys that are out there that are watching. And they watch the success. They watch the tactics, the TTPs that changed, the adaptations that needed to happen. And they use that and apply that to a new way to attempt to make profit. And when we combine those changing and more successful TTPs with other things that were happening in the industry, we saw a huge breakout that we're still dealing with today, and that is the advent of modern ransomware, which is a massive cybersecurity pandemic, if you will, that we are all dealing with that you guys probably hear way too much about. But let's talk about the why behind it. Why has ransomware been so much more prevalent 
so much more successful than it was than we saw previous malware where we had denial of service attacks, which required or asked for ransom, where we had um, attacks with things like Zbot and Zeus variant Trojans that also stole identities and were able to make money. And now we see this happening at a prevalence level that is tremendously broader, but we invest way more money in cybersecurity. Well, to understand that motivation, we also have to consider the fact that there is a very, very close alignment between the increase in ransomware and the advent of cryptocurrency. Now, and this is not to say that I am not for the value of a decentralized currency, and I am not throwing away the idea that this can bring value to us as different things that we can do on blockchain, I think are very, very interesting. But what I am saying is that unfortunately, the fact that much of this currency can be exchanged in a completely anonymous manner has meant that it has become a measure of liquidity with complete anonymity. And that has what is what has led to a massive increase in ransomware is now the ability to receive anonymous payments, at least when done right, anonymous payments that can't be traced, that you can't get back, and that are able to be conducted by just about anyone in the world. Um, and now the ability to get paid on an attack has decreased in complexity so much so that ransomware attackers generally get paid. Unfortunately, stats say something like one in every three attacks today. This has led us to what I will refer to as the second criminal age of cybersecurity. And the second criminal age of cybersecurity is marked very, very much by the amount of money that has changed hands. We are talking about not thousands, not millions, but billions of dollars in losses. So much so that even these guys have decided to get in on the game and begin to play in the cyber realm where they have both done ransomware attacks as well as breaking into cryptocurrency exchanges and wallets to steal and right, to get around sanctions in their country for how they can bring in money. They're actually making money using cybersecurity attacks. Now we can see that there is a massive increase. If we go back to 2015 and we look all the way forward to 2021, and this is a report that was done by Reuters, which I thought was very well executed and researched. You can go take a look at it if you want to. From 325 million to $20 billion in estimated annual ransomware damages, the difference is staggering. And there is definitely at least some correlation. You can argue this is not causation, and I would agree with you. But there is some correlation to be said about the price uh, correlation between Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies and the increase in overall annual, annual ransomware damage. Again, cryptocurrency is not the cause, but it is now a primary liquidity mechanism for people who are conducting these kinds of attacks. Now, we can't always just blame that. In fact, there are many major other things that we can look at in the world today and say, well, the reason this is happening is because there are people like Maxim Yakubets and Igor Turashev, who are the heads of Evil Corp. Many of you guys have probably read articles about this. And this is an organization, a tax paying company in Russia, who made an estimated $70 million last year conducting ransomware attacks against US companies. And they operate with almost complete impunity inside of Russia, provided that they don't disrupt any Russian interest, attack Russian countries, but they pretty much have free reign to attack American companies as it stands today, which is pretty significant. And until we see major policy changes, we can't just say, well, cryptocurrency has caused the ransomware problem. No, actually international policy and law and other things that are out there that are very advantageous for people who are in some of these countries to actually conduct these attacks without being prosecuted by any standard or law that is out there, including the law and the power of the US to go after them, which really doesn't exist in some of these places. Um, and, and until that changes, we will continue to see this problem. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, why does this really matter to us? And hopefully we'll change slides as we do that too. There it goes. What does this really mean to us and why does it matter? Well, if we take a look at the motivations, and we understand who's behind these attacks and what motivates them when we look at actors like APT1 and understand that they're looking for economic advantage. And we look at actors like APT28 and we understand they're looking to assert military influence and power. And then we can look at actors like Evil Corp and say they're clearly after profit, which is very much available today. We also have to ask ourselves, what is of value to us that we need to protect that would allow them to achieve any of these objectives in our organizations? Primarily speaking, if we go back historically, especially I would say pre-2015, 
right, we were always concerned with PII. It was always about protecting the data. And most of us had a focus either from a compliance and regulatory perspective or strictly from our own desire to protect data reputationally for our organizations to protect that PII and our customer data. But the reality is, is, and this has proven itself true over the last five years, is that availability is equally, if not more important. There are many times where people had data stolen and they did not pay millions of dollars to get that data back but they are most certainly paying millions of dollars to prevent disruption to their overall availability, especially for e-commerce organizations if they're disrupting revenue generation with those systems too as well. So this may not primarily be about reputation for the attacker anymore, but it is most certainly about reputation for organizations these days like us. And that begins to drive to new kinds of attacks, new things we have to be aware of like double jeopardy attacks double ransom attacks, if you will. At the first threat, we're going to encrypt and steal your data. And then threat number two, if you also don't pay us to decrypt the data that we've stolen, we will make it public, right? Even more so now we're skipping the triple dog there and going straight to the quadruple extortion attack where we're now saying things like, hey, we're going to encrypt your data and then you're going to pay us to get it back. Or then we're going to exfiltrate that data and threaten to leak it. But then also we'll DDoS you at the same time and take your systems down. And then even more so, well, we'll have direct communication with customers and stakeholders. In fact, there's even some investigation reports I've read where people have had direct communication from somebody who threatened to go to stock analysts who are preparing to release information about prices and quarterlies and other things like that. And they were going to go to analysts and talk about how the company had been breached and that they had access to their data and could take them down at any given time. So the question now is why are we talking about this and what does it mean to us? And then because no cybersecurity presentation is complete without a good quote from Sun Tzu, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of 100 battles. Now, interestingly enough, almost everybody talks about know your enemy or know yourself independently, but this is talking about both, right? We have to know the enemy as much, as much as we know yourself. The emphasis often is on, hey, do we understand our risk and our vulnerabilities and our architecture and our systems? And what we also need to understand is the motivations of our attackers. Why might they target us? And we have to be considering. And because we don't wanna just be like every good cybersecurity presentation, we wanna be a great one. Let's have two quotes from Sun Tzu. Every battle is won before it is fought. So we should be stopping to ask the questions, to do tabletops and ask ourselves, hey, is there a reason that my organization might be targeted by a nation state? Is there a geopolitical motivation? Is there something that we're involved in? Are we supporting government activities? Do we support and host that kind of data? Are we doing research as an educational institution on behalf of the government or certainly on behalf of anything in the military industrial complex? From a cyber criminal perspective, okay, what are the systems for us that are really about profit generation? Where can we not afford to have an outage? Where are the areas in our network where we would genuinely pay ransom before we would allow those systems to be taken down? And then you need to tabletop that and play that out and really think that through. And how will you respond? Are the right controls, disaster recovery, protections, incident response measures, are they in place? Are they tested? Do they work? And you have to go through these and ask the tough questions of your organization about even things like hacktivists. Is there anything ideologically, right? Are you maybe involved in hosting for a controversial political figure that happened recently for a cybersecurity company who is involved in hosting? And they happened to host the website for somebody who was a controversial political figure and the entire company came under attack as a result of that. Um, and that was a very significant activity that they had to respond to that at the time it didn't seem like they were truly prepared for. But if we go through and we tabletop, not just with the basic, hey, we're dealing with a ransomware attack, hey, we're dealing with a DDoS attack, hey, we're dealing with a malware outbreak of some kind. But if we go through and we tabletop where we're truly looking at who the adversary is, and we're doing adversary simulation, adversary emulation, we're saying, okay, what would it look like if a nation state attacked our organization? Why would they do it? What kinds of things would they be after? How would we respond? How would we defend? Who do we involve? If we ask those questions with the right understanding of motivations and evolutions of attackers, then we can actually get to a measure of defense and readiness that will keep us in a place where we actually might be successful in some of these activities. All right, guys, that is all I have for you today. I hope that uh, short run through attacker history and motivations was 
educational and valuable to you. Um, I'll pause here if there are any questions or anything that we want to talk through or respond to. Um, I'm happy to take those now. We have thoughts on why some countries are embracing cryptos and others are heavy handed against it or not. Oof. Um, I, I don't know that I have a particular opinion on why I see or don't see that. Um, I think in many ways, it just comes down to what are the existing regulatory organizations in each individual country and how that regulatory organization decides they are going to look at it. I don't know if it's necessarily cultural or, you know, as much one country or the next as it is just there's regulatory bodies, like, for example, the SEC in the US may look at it much differently than any other country who also has their own stock market and trading and things like that, too, as well. Um, as we've seen, the SEC has, has very much struggled struggled in how they want to handle and deal with uh, cryptocurrency, whether it is or is not a security in and of itself. Any other questions? Um, do we have any experience with ransomware negotiations? Unfortunately, yes. Um, and how companies approach that while still engaging with law enforcement. Um, there are sound ways in which you can engage in this with law enforcement um, when you are and if you are, especially if you are obligated under regulatory requirements um, to report. Um, and most of us are, um, and you should engage with law enforcement if you have that kind of attack because you do want it to be properly investigated. And hopefully um, there's a possibility for prosecution to get maybe some recompense for what occurred. Um, that being said, um, law enforcement can advise against paying that. Um, that does not mean you have to follow that advice. There are many organizations where law enforcement has been involved and they have recommended not paying and the organization being the victim of the ransomware attack has said it's actually more important to our business to be back online right now and pay this ransom as compared to complying with this for the sake of not giving into this criminal organization. Um, it does happen and, and pers on a personal level, I will say, um, I'm never a fan of, of seeing people pay, but I absolutely understand when some businesses do. It is a business risk decision. It's not just a moral or an ethical decision at times, which is how I tend to look at it personally. I, I can tend to be a little bit black and white on some of those things. Um, this is, I'm very opposed to cyber criminal activity on a personal level, um, but I do understand why some businesses pay. And when you're talking about losing hundreds of thousands of dollars an hour for some businesses, um, you know, and, and if the ransom is, you know, a million and a half dollars and you've been down for three days, well, there's a point where it's like, just pay it. And that's, that's what makes sense at this point for the business. I understand it. If I was a CEO, I'd, I'd probably be pretty stubborn in, in that myself. Um, but um, hopefully I would also be the kind of CEO that would enforce us to have very good recovery, backup procedures, and other things that would protect us. I hope that answers the question clearly enough. It is, it's kind of an ambiguous area right now as far as what you should and should not do. Any other questions, guys? Happy to answer anything else, and, and if not, uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you guys, and uh, please feel free to, to follow up um, with any other questions you have. I'm sure we can get them routed to me if they're, they're not for public consumption. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Oh, Looks more. like we have a couple oh. more coming in. Oh, yeah, we do. Right here at the end. Okay. Got a couple that came in. Um, are there not any international laws against using cryptocurrency on the dark web? Um, there do not. Uh, there is not any regulation against it. it cryptocurrency... There's no way to prove necessarily what cryptocurrency is being used for or tie it to a specific transaction. Um, that's that's the hard part is is it would be illegal to pay for anything with any type of currency if it was illegal, right? To, to pay money for any legal service, any legal substance, anything like that, right? The exchange of dollars for that is part of what makes it illegal. Um, the problem is then you have to tie that exchange of currency to that particular illegal activity. And so when something is happening on the dark web and it is being paid for with cryptocurrency, the cryptocurrency can be a completely anonymous transaction that can't be tracked back to the individual activity, right, and may have no association with it, right? The, the cyber criminal forum 
and you know Monero coin, there's no tie between those in any way, shape, or form to say, oh, this is definitively how they paid or received payment for this particular criminal activity they did. Very, very hard to tie those things together, prove them, and make that something that would then hold up in court. Um, you might be able to intimidate and get confession with that as a law enforcement officer, possibly. But if you were really to go to trial, the defense attorney would probably have a field day with saying that this is strictly circumstantial and you can't prove that this is what this currency transaction was for. Um, what are some approaches or opportunities that small medium businesses overlook in the cyber realm in terms of protections and preventions? Oh, this is a great question, actually, because I um, I, I think there were a lot of things that are overlooked um, that are real easy wins for a lot of small, medium business. Um, first and foremost, turn on multi-factor authentication everywhere. Right? The vast majority of compromise we see today happens with stolen credentials as the initial vector in. If we start with saying, well, we'll turn on multi-factor everywhere, right? and for any non-trusted device, you're going to have to use multi-factor authentication, man, that reduces the attack surface for the user entity significantly. If we can then combine that with something as simple as a good, solid, well-reputed endpoint technology, which has EDR involved, and there are numerous of these out there, um, Palo Alto Cortex, XDR, CrowdStrike, Sentinel One, even Microsoft's Defender for Endpoint, the, what was Defender ATP before. These are great technologies. Um, they do a phenomenally good job of giving, giving visibility to security operations personnel um, and security engineers to what's actually happening on the endpoint. Um, those two things alone are huge. The last one I would say is useful disk encryption. Use it everywhere use it well, enforce it as a policy, put everybody on company-owned devices. And if you do those things, um, you will jumpstart your cybersecurity program by leaps and bounds with just some very simple changes that will not cost a small and medium business so much money that it impacts the bottom line. Um, where do we see ransomware going next, moving beyond holding data and exposing it if uh, ransom is not paid? Uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think we've already seen some of this happen. Um, the Colonial Pipeline attack, um, as well as the US Farmers Co-op um, are two great examples of where we see this beginning to look at how do we go beyond just disrupting services or technology, but to actually disrupting um, disrupting entire regions, um, disrupting oil distribution, disrupting food distribution um, in ways that have tremendously large impact that force payment in a scale that we have not seen before. Um, the other thing that we're also seeing is attackers becoming incredibly educated about the financial status of organizations, having gone to public companies requesting ransom. And when the public company says, we don't have that kind of cash, they're literally replying with their quarterly and saying, well, this says differently. You definitely have this kind of cash, pay us. But also with that, then making threats of, well, we're going to now align the timing of this ransomware attack also to when you're then having your quarterly shareholder call. And then this is going to be something that's going to come out at the same time. And now as that's released and the stock analysts see this, we're actually going to tank your stock price as a part of a ransomware attack too as well. And now we're going to hit you where it really, hurt, where it really hurts at the board and at the shareholders. And you're going to pay us because of that. And uh, I have to say, um, I, I've been pretty impressed with some of the research that's actually done. You have, you do have to learn to respect uh, your adversaries, and and some of these guys have done some incredibly good research. Um, is there any effort to establish an international body or set of laws to deal with cybercrime across international boundaries? Actually, yes. Um, if you go look that that exact question up right now in Google, you'll see that there was about 30 nations that got together last week to have initial talks specifically about the broad spread ransomware problem. Um, I don't know where that will go. It's a very challenging problem. Um, but I think we see some good collaboration between the US and the EU right now to begin to try to push this problem forward. The problem that we will have to then deal with is, you know, if we go to like six party talks and we look at kind of the six big nations of the world, if you will, um, not everybody in a six party talk um, right now would be in agreement on how we should handle this. Um, and we're going to have to get fairly broad spectrum buy in um, to make this stop. Um, thoughts on quantum communication with regards to cybersecurity and information integrity. Could this be a promising technology for mitigating cyber attacks? 
Um, quantum technology is still in a very, very, very early phase. Um, it's a fascinating sector of tech. Um, I, I do actually read quite a bit about it because I'm fascinated by the ideas and the potential. Um, I don't know how far along we are. The, the practical applications that we've seen of quantum computing um, right now are very, very limited. Um, and I struggle, and, and then this could be my my you know, IQ limitations, maybe, um, I struggle to see how it would be stretched to apply that more broadly to problems um, outside of very specific mathematical based algorithms that, that you can structure something in quantum computing to solve. Um, so there's limited applications. And we look at that maybe for cryptography. Um, there's applications for quantum computing and in quantum cryptography, but then applications for broad spectrum cybersecurity are more difficult because um, even if we try to improve data security, but if we don't also then improve authentication and access control as a part of that, well, they'll just bypass that by using the things that are already authenticating to where the data is decrypted and available, which is what we see right now. We see systems that do have full disk encryption, encryption enabled and servers that are encrypting things. And, and But then we see attackers getting access to that and saying, well, it, it, you may have had it encrypted, but you're already logged in and you've already decrypted the system. And now I have access to the data based on that. Um, and that becomes a problem in and of itself. But then the other part of that is that doesn't fix the availability problem for us too as well. right? And so they can say, well, you may have this encrypted. That's nice. I'll take the entire thing, wrap it in another box of encrypted encryption and lock you out from it. Um, and now you're unavailable. So it doesn't matter. I didn't need to decrypt it. What I needed to do was stop it from being available. So it may help with information leaks, but it would not help from service disruption and availability um, and then potential revenue loss as a result of that. So um, I, I will we'll wait to see how it plays out. I think it's quantum is, is fairly early. Um, I'm fascinated by the topic, um, and I look forward to some of the innovation that could come from it. Who knows? Maybe there'll be some great breakthroughs right now. I still think it's fairly limited in scope. All right. I don't see um, any other questions that have come in. So that being said, guys, um, it has been an absolute pleasure. Um, thank you again for your time, and I hope everybody has a great day and a great week. Great. Thanks a lot, Jordan. Really appreciate it. Um, just want to say thank you for your service, too. Oh, thank you for your support. It was an honor. Really, really awesome talk. Great. OK, so uh, everybody, um, next week we have our symposium, our annual symposium. So hope to see everybody there. You can go to our website, um, serious.purdue.edu, to find information on registering for that. So thanks a lot, Jordan. Take care.